Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. I'm Amir Oren, filling in this week for Jonathan Hessen. For several years now, while Israel's domestic security situation was considered relatively good with long periods of quiet punctured by few incidents and frequent reports of airstrikes against hostile targets in neighboring countries, military intelligence kept issuing a strategic alert regarding an outbreak of violence emanating from the West Bank, either because of internal Palestinian tensions or due to individual frustrations. Whatever the cause, the warning seems to have sensed it right, with a series of deadly attacks on civilians in major urban centers and with fear turning to panic, Israel's political and security leaders tried to go on the offensive. They have responded to a perceived wave of terror with Operation Wavesbreaker, focusing on the Palestinian Authority's district of Jenin. How effective can these cross currents be, and what are the possible repercussions? To analyze it, uh, we are joined uh, from Central Israel by Brigadier General in the Reserves Yossi Kuperwasser, Project Director on Middle East Developments at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. Hello, General. Hi, Amir. Good to be here. And also uh, Dr. Nir Bombs, Research Fellow at the Moshe Dayan Center at Tel Aviv University. And with me uh, in the studio is Reserve Colonel Ruven Ben Shalom, TV7's Powers in Play panelist and uh, cross-cultural strategist. Ruven, welcome aboard. Thank you. Uh, let's start with you, uh, Yossi. Uh, you um, have uh, watched from uh, very close uh, various developments uh, on the Palestinian security front uh, in the late 90s uh, and beyond when uh, Yasser Arafat was there and later. Are we uh, seeing now a new, not only wave, but a new intifada? Well, I think it's too early to speak about the new intifada, but there is a, definitely a wave of terror attacks. And what's interesting about this, uh, about it is that uh, while it is motivated by uh, something that is relevant to this specific period of time, both the uh, day of the land and the Ramadan and uh, uh, the f- frustration with the Negev summit that uh, clarified, manifested how uh, pushed to the corner is the Palestinian issue today, uh, it is. Uh, it has caused a change in the way terrorism appears in the eyes of, or in the, the feelings of uh, Israelis, because in the last couple of years, maybe like five years, most of the attacks uh, that were carried out against uh, Israelis in the, in the context of the Palestinian terror campaign were conducted in the territories uh, that Israel occupied since uh, '67, and uh, in the Judea and Samaria area mostly, or in uh, bursts of uh, violence from Gaza which was something that uh, Israelis learned how to live with and uh, thought that it's not going to attack them. Now, the center moved to central Israel, and this is a ch- major change in the, in the feeling of security, the sense of security that Israelis have. And the second thing that happened was, was that from in, instead of just using knives and uh, car ramming, all of a sudden the uh, firearms are used in the context of these attacks. This is, again, something that is very dangerous. Thirdly, there is the feeling now that every Palestinian is, uh, can be a, a participant in this terror wave, unlike what happened before when this was confined to uh, area, the Palestinians living in the in Judea and Samaria area. And today, Israeli Arabs are involved in that as well. And most of it is not organized, but it's coming from all walks of the Palestinian organized uh, terror uh, organizations. Like most of the organiz- most of the people that are involved are actually coming from uh, the Fatah, uh, the, the, the Laksa brigades, uh, Laksa Martyr brigades, which means that everybody is involved. It's not only Hamas, it's not only Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Everybody is involved. So a lot of uh, a lot of changes that uh, erode the, the sense of security of Israelis and uh, necessitate uh, some uh, different approach. To handling this problem, and uh, but, this but, uh, to the taking to, uh, the offensive is uh, is necessary. It's a little bit late in coming, but it's necessary. I'm not sure it's going to, as you mentioned in the beginning, 
I'm not sure it's going to put an end to this wave, but it's going to make sure that it's going to be more difficult for those who are involved in the, these attempts to carry out terror attacks to uh, actually come through on their uh, uh, commitment to carry out these attacks. And this by itself, if some of them are going to be arrested on time or uh, held from uh, crossing the fence towards Israel proper, then this is uh, have going to have a positive impact on, on this uh, on the sense of security of the Israelis. Dr. Bombs, um the uh, attacks are uh, being conducted, uh, one may say, retail rather than wholesale. And there is no clear chain of command from the headquarters of uh, Hamas or the uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, or as General Cooper Wasser mentioned, uh, Fatah and uh, its own uh, uh, organizations uh, like uh, Tanzim. Uh, so that makes it very uh, difficult to predict um, who is going uh, to do what, especially uh, since the adversary uh, is also learning and they know better than to post uh, uh, their comments beforehand on uh, social media saying uh, we are going uh, to commit uh, jihad and become uh, uh, shahid and, and so forth. So what can one do um, in such a situation in order to uh, forestall uh, such attacks. First, Amir, this is indeed true, but it's also not necessarily new. The uh, phenomena of uh, lone wolves uh, have increased, and not just in the context of the Palestinian arena. We, we have seen this uh, also in the context of ISIS, uh, the Islamic State, and other terrorist organizations around the world. Broadly speaking, I think uh, we can look at the crisis of leadership. You have, uh, even when it comes to terrorist organizations, uh, you have people who are inspired and are following an ideological strain and acting on their own. But within this context, it is also a caveat. Uh, the IDF, for example, is operating now in Jenin, and it's operating in Jenin because uh, there is a, a certain structure uh, and, and uh, uh, degree of organization uh, that is located there. Uh, what can be done is what is being done, is actually uh, listening very carefully to the discourse. Uh, uh, the security agencies here and elsewhere have learned how, how to uh, listen to the social media, how to listen to the discourse, how to become aware, uh, certainly when it comes to the, not, to the log wolves of uh, uh, signs that may indicate uh, that somebody may uh, uh, come to, to uh, create an attack when these signs are there. Of course, not always the signs are there, and sometimes uh, these lone wolves become actually more sophisticated. They understand this, uh, and, and they are hiding their uh, uh, intentions uh, fairly well. And then it comes to this process of uh, uh, what do you do as a response, and how do you uh, react uh, when it comes to their immediate circle, to their family that may or may not have been uh, involved. Uh, and that brings to, to bear uh, complex issues. Uh, what should you do to families of uh, Israeli citizens uh, who have been now involved in terrorist attacks and have been sympathizers for uh, the Islamic State. We have seen, and we, the, the security services uh, are, are aware of people who uh, uh, have expressed a certain degree of uh, sympathy to these types of agendas. And part of what's been happening now is uh, they're opening all these boxes and uh, uh, take uh, uh, an extra look social media and otherwise, and, and act against all those uh, who may uh, uh, be involved and may have a chance to uh, be, become involved in the next attack. This is a part of the security uh, uh, circle that needs to be uh, operated in order to uh, prevent the uh, next attack. Uh, Colonel Ben Shalom, is the Israeli defense and security establishment well organized as it is uh, composed of various components uh, not all of whom uh, belong to the same uh, ministry or um, obey the same political master, even though the uh, government, the cabinet, is the overall uh, coordinator. So you have the police within Israel, but the border patrol is part of the police, and it has an elite uh, unit, uh, Yamam, uh, which operates alongside the military and the uh, ISA, or Shabak, the internal security agency. The military is in charge of uh, the West Bank, but in East Jerusalem, um, which uh, has been annexed uh, to Israel, the police again uh, is working. 
Um, so you have all of these uh, forces working alongside each other. And we have seen um, a week ago or so in Tel Aviv that sometimes um, you see chaos, perhaps too many forces from too many organizations with no clear uh, chain of command. Well, let me start from the end. What we saw in Tel Aviv was a mess, and I'm sure the operational units are going to sit down and take the lessons learned from there. Uh, I think maybe over-motivation, maybe even taking to hysteria, uh, and you know, we threw everything we had at it. That was a mess. In general, our cultural characteristics are very positive for fighting terror, and our results are amazing. Okay, for the last few decades, uh, counterparts from around the world come to Israel to learn how we do it. Many of these counterparts adopted some of the issues that you're ta- asking me about now, about the uh, interagency collaboration, because what we do here, Israelis, is we don't adhere to guidelines and rules and restrictions. Uh, sometimes that's bad. In fighting terror, it's good, because we don't have the classic Hollywood scene where the police officer is investigating and then the FBI guy flashes his badge and you get out of here, this is my jurisdiction. We don't have that. We just... Uh, tackle the mission and work together without even asking where the guidelines are. When I worked in the Air Force, I used to get a call from ISA, what we call Shabak or Shin Bet, and they would say, we need a helicopter to fly somewhere. I said, you got it. In 15 minutes, they had a helicopter. Wait, who authorized it? What's the mission? They asked, I give, you know. You do and then you ask later. So we see amazing collaboration between the various units on the ground in Judea and Samaria or the West Bank as Naftali Bennett, our prime minister, just coined maybe for the first time in Israeli history. We see the army working together with police units, with Yamam, the border police special terror unit, flying in Air Force helicopters, all working together seamlessly. This doesn't mean, again, that we do everything perfect, but I think combining incredible intelligence, mostly from Shin Bet, but also IDF assets, and just everyone throwing in what they're good at yields very good results in countering terrorism. Uh, General Kupewasser, um, are we Israelis, uh, and especially the Israeli authorities, overreacting? The very aim of uh, terrorists is uh, to cause panic uh, and uh, magnify their lethal uh, actions uh, tenfold through the media and through the sense of insecurity in every um, civilian's uh, heart, while the actual results, while of course um, uh, unfortunate, nevertheless the number of casualties is less than one bus which exploded uh, during uh, the, the very tragic periods in the mid-90s and then uh, in the early uh, 2000s. Um, Should Israelis be more reasonable, more clear-headed? The the public reaction is is natural. That's that's how the public reacts when uh, when it feels that uh, uh, he's exposed to uh, terror attacks. And and by the way, the resilience of the Israeli public, even under this uh, situation, was... uh, Quite impressive. Uh, you saw yesterday when they uh, reopened the uh, Ilka Bar in uh, in Tel Aviv, and it was uh, heavily uh, dense and crowded. Uh, everybody was came there in order to show that we keep on doing uh, uh, what we would like to do, and uh, the daily life is not uh, hampered by the terror wave. But when uh, there is a terrorist shooting all over in, in, a, in a bar. Everybody runs away. That's uh, that's to be expected, and I, I don't think that anybody can be blamed for that. I think the the, the problem is that uh, we had the, the government, and the security services had a, a wrong perception, and they and this perception was shared with the public. And what happened was that the perception was broken all of a sudden, and it real, everybody realized that the government is not prepared for the kind of threat that they are facing now, because our perception was, as I said before, that. These terror attacks are happening in the in the territories in the Judean Samaria area, not uh, not in Tel Aviv, not in Bnei Brak, not in Hadera, not in uh, Beersheba. It's uh, somewhere else. They are prepared, perpetrated only by people who are uh, uh, stabbing and uh, using cars and throwing stones and Molotov cocktails. This is this was the impression, and all of a sudden firearms inside Tel Aviv. That's something different and it causes panic. It, it, it causes fear. That's uh, that's the logic of. Uh, it's a, it's a combination of the logic of the terrorists 
and the, unprepared, the, the, the lack of preparation by the, uh, by the government and the misperception of the government. And the, the misperception was that Hamas is behind it. Hamas was not behind it. There was no Hamas involvement in, in anything that happened. And everybody saw, spoke about Hamas from Gaza trying to convince the people in the West Bank to, to carry out attacks, trying to, uh, to get the, the Israeli arms in, to carry out terror attacks. It was not Hamas. It is the entire Palestinian uh, people, people from all kinds of places, getting involved in that. Not only because of Hamas, but because of everybody telling them to do that, including the Palestinian Authority. You look at the, the Palestinian Authority, they, have, they keep on with their messages of uh, incitement, of uh, hate indoctrination. That's what they do day in, day out. So anybody, who, uh, and that's why people are coming to, to carry out this, uh, these attacks are people who are more affiliated with the Fatah, not, not with the Hamas. But the the uh, Al-Aqsa Brigade, that's, these are the people that are coming. Or from Daesh, that's uh, the, the Israeli arms that were involved with the sort of affiliated with Daesh. This was, this was the, the origin of the, of the attacks, not Hamas. Palestinian Islamic Jihad was trying to do something, and uh, they were hit on the way to carrying out an attack. And this was an organized uh, group. And I, I don't agree with the idea of a lone wolf. We have to understand how, how terrorism works these days with the social media. You don't need a cell. You just pour in hatred. You put in, uh, you send these messages that uh, terrorism is good and uh, that uh, the enemy is Satan and all, all these messages. And when you do that, you can count on some people to feel that it's their role to do something about it at a certain period of time when they feel that the time is uh, ripe for them to carry out an attack. They do that. You, nobody needs to tell them what to do. They don't need a cell. They don't need an organization. That's how terrorism works these days. These are not lone wolves. This is a system that pre prepares these kind of terrorists and to counts on them to operate at a certain period of time when they feel that the time is right. And now when Ramadan is closed with the land of the day, the day of the land, the, the emotions are high, and some people are highly motivated because of these emotions. This, by, by the way, has nothing to do with economic conditions. Most of the people that are involved in these terror attacks are uh, well-doing. Uh, they are not poor. Uh, it has not, nothing to do with the social uh, problems. Sometimes uh, some of the people that call, uh, carry out the attacks are socially uh, challenged. But, uh, but this was not the case this time. These were regular people that so, just feel that they do something that is uh, uh, required for them by their society, be it uh, the Muslim society, the, the religious uh, motivation, be it the national motivation by the Palestinian people, and they feel that they do something good for their people. And when they look at the, at the reaction of their leaders to what uh, previous terrorists did, the commitment of the Palestinian Authority to pay salaries to terrorists, uh, the way they uh, adore them and uh, praise their activities, they say, yes, why, why not me? And uh, there's a, this inspirational effect is, is calling on more people to carry out the attacks. And that's why we, we need now to change our perception, understand that there is this kind of threat, take the necessary security steps in order to cope with it, and maybe take some steps also against the, the leaders that... Uh, call on the, on the Palestinians to keep doing that. You know, and I'm talking about even the leaders of the Palestinian Authority. The governor of uh, Jenin spoke highly of the terrorists uh, just a couple of days ago. So did the leaders of Fatah in the Jenin area. Everybody speaks about the fact that the, um, that the uh, Palestinian Authority does not control the Jenin area. They do control it. They, <laughs> they use their control and their presence there. They walk in the streets very safe. Uh, everybody could have seen Atab the uh, <laughs> Uh, secretary of Fatah in the Jenin area, walking in the streets uh, very safely, and uh, he has no problem. And he calls on the, the, the terrorist heroes. That's that's what we are facing. It's uh, we have to we have to leave the old perception that they don't control it. That they, these are lone wolves. These are not lone wolves. These are people that were uh, pre-planned by the incitement and by the head indoctrination to carry out this kind of attack. Uh, we will return to uh, this last uh, comment by General Kupervasor in a moment, but uh, just to remind uh, ourselves, yes, uh, not all uh, uh, terrorists are uh, desperate uh, uh, perpetrators because of some personal 
problems, but so was uh, Baruch Goldstein. Um, a medical doctor, a captain in the Israeli uh, Defense Forces uh, Reserves, an immigrant from the United States who committed the massacre at the cave of the patriarchs in order uh, to uh, hurt the Oslo process. And this brought about several uh, revenge terror acts by Hamas, which were not uh, hampered by the Palestinian Authority. So just to put it in perspective, there are some, not so many, but there are some terrorists on the other side too. But regarding what General Cooper has just said about the Palestinian Authority, what uh, happened to the security forces there? Was there over-reliance by uh, their Israeli counterparts on the Palestinian intelligence network uh, telling um, Israel uh, look, there is uh, so-and-so at the Janin refugee camp, of course, in addition to what the Israeli intelligence apparatus is doing. For what we hear, the security cooperation and the security coordination uh, between the Israelis and Palestinians has still been working. And, and I think we're looking now at the attacks that had happened and not those that were prevented. And, and I think, and General Cooper Wasser may have uh, more info on this, that uh, pr they're probably that list is much longer. Uh, first, let me agree uh, with, with the comment that uh, General Cooper Wasser had uh, before. Uh, the, the limitation of this lone wolf model has to do with the fact that eventually there is a structure. Weapon does not come out of thin air. Uh, training and information uh, that is required for a, a given terrorist to go to Tel Aviv is also coming from somewhere. There is a circle and there is a support system. This is also why uh, it's important to have a certain degree of coordination when this coordination works, um, but that sometimes either the Palestinians are incapable or worse, not willing to uh, uh, prevent uh, uh, these type of, of uh, activities. And that's certainly uh, difficult and, and, you know, add to that uh, when it comes to citizens, uh, Arab uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel, um, who are joining the circle, which is very, very difficult. Uh, so, uh, of course, the security uh, mechanism needs to work, and they are working, uh, and now they're working uh, much, much harder uh, in order uh, uh, to deal with the existing cells uh, acting upon uh, the information and the intelligence, and they will do uh, the best uh, they can uh, to prevent the next attack. I think it's important, uh, as was mentioned before, to look at the broader record. There are more people uh, there are more Palestinians uh, uh, who were incited and would have wanted to uh, uh, create such attacks. In every, even in the last uh, few days, we've heard of a number of attacks that were prevented. I think uh, we have to also admit that uh, the fact that what you've mentioned before that, it, that, that there wasn't a bus that was exploded, uh, we could have seen something much worse. Uh, the uh, uh, an armed uh, uh, terrorist in Tel Aviv um, with uh, an automatic uh, weapon could have killed many more people. And, and therefore, uh, we should not just assume that things are, are uh, uh, just becoming, became a bit moderate. And, and we have the danger of uh, seeing uh, similar scenes to those uh, the, the very terrible scenes that we've seen in the early days of the uh, Second Intifada. Uh, so, uh, uh, of course, that there's no uh, reason to be uh, complacent here. And there's certainly a lot of reasons to, to point fingers into the security uh, services uh, of uh, the Palestinians and demand from them that they will do uh, their part, partly because it's also their interest. But we also just uh, to remind ourselves that we have seen waves uh, of terrorism before. Uh, we've seen more difficult waves uh, and we've seen waves that were prevented. Uh, I do hope that this is going to be a wave that's not going to escalate into a whole intifada. And I also uh, believe that no, there are no, uh, Dr. many Bums. voices uh, also among the Palestinians who understand that uh, another intifada, uh, just like the previous intifada, is not going to serve them, is not going to serve the Palestinian cause, and is not going to serve the Palestinian people. Just like we have uh, uh, now a very vivid discourse in Israel uh, amongst Arabs on this issue, or perhaps it's going to be a, an, another uh, opportunity for a different leadership to say, well, perhaps we should actually try to adopt a different path to the future. Colonel Ben Shalom, what is to be done? Um, is the lack 
of uh, political process the problem because there are two views uh, on it. Uh, yes, uh, the political leadership on the Palestinian side is indifferent um, because there is no political horizon. But had there been one, uh, the uh, terrorist organizations would have done a lot in order to sabotage it. So what is your view? My view is we can never think the Palestinian issue can be hid under the rug and it'll be okay. And then we can't be surprised and say, what do the Palestinians want from us? We, we gave them this, we gave them that. No, we have to remember this issue will have to be resolved. The more they feel they are left behind, like in the Abraham Accords and everything we've been doing in the region, the more they will feel they're going to want the, the attention regionally and internationally. So we can't hide it. Still, we have to always fight terror as we did, you know, mow the lawn, catch the terrorists, try to thwart as much as possible. But the problem will not go away. Nir Bones, your view? I think that uh, the Abraham Accords is actually uh, potentially one model uh, that can be used to, as a way to move forward. We have seen that normalization can actually bring about improvement in the lives of people in the Middle East. Uh, and that certainly uh, was meant to also improve the conditions in the lives of Palestinians. I think we have partners, Arab partners, that are willing to work together in order to bring all the sides uh, into a, a situation uh, of acceptance, um, and into building a different future. And I hope that the Palestinians will actually uh, decide to endorse that path uh, yeah. and come to terms uh, with the idea of actually moving forward in a more positive way rather than giving uh, credence uh, to uh, a wave of terrorists. Yossi Cooper, you have the last word, one word. Yeah, well, I, I'm not very optimistic because I think the Palestinians are still committed to a narrative that uh, puts in the center the struggle against Zionism. They are still committed to that. Uh, they, there are other models like the Abraham Accords, and uh, we all can all hope that something will change. But we have to be realistic. This is not going to happen tomorrow morning. The, right now, they are committed to this narrative of struggle. We will not be able to uh, solve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. But nevertheless, thank you all. Yossi Kupavasser, Nir Bums, and Ruven Ben Shalom. And we will be back for another edition of Jerusalem Studio from TV7. Thank you.